with high frequency data backed by our army of experts. Freightwave Sonar puts you in command. Welcome to your Nooner with Tuner and your Fiverr with the Drivers. Thanks for tuning in on the podcast, the live stream. You're watching this on demand or on Sirius XM's Road Dog Truck. And thanks for coming to the house. Hey, did y'all survive the eclipse? Big event. Monday. A lot of people getting FOMO because, like, uh, people were there. They said it was, like, transformative. They found their place in the universe by looking up at the uh, sun. And also a lot of people said, uh, remember, I, I brought that up. I said, what if you had, like, bootleg eclipse glasses and you got your eyes burned? Well, on Google search, like, the trends on my eyes hurt went up high. I bet there were a lot of, uh, you know, those third-party shady manufacturers those glasses. So those of you who are watching, I hope you're okay. But if you're not, you can also listen to us on audio in case the eclipse blinded you. A couple of headlines before we get into some amazing guests today. Some more news out of the FMCSA and their Safe Driver program. It's on FreightWaves.com. This headline right here, FMCS, FMCSA has rejected 34% of under-teenage drivers who have entered their program. That's right. John Gallagher reports the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration Administration says only 113 carriers have applied for its under 21 truck driver apprenticeship program since the agency began accepting applications back in July of 2022. It's a dismal sign for the initiative that they had expected to recruit over a thousand carriers and up to 3,000 drivers, falling very short of that. The data included in a fiscal year 2022 report submitted to Congress last week by the FMCSA also revealed that as of February 2024, FMCSA has rejected 34% or 38 of the 113 applications it's received. The agency has fully approved only 30% or 34 of those applications. Why were they rejected though? Well, they say the applications have been disproved due to not meeting FMCSA's safety performance criteria. They're having similar issues with their under 21 military program as well. In regards to that, the FMCSA stated, despite significant outreach and recruitment efforts, only a very small number of drivers participated. There were not enough interest from the intended participants in operating a CMV in interstate commerce as a profession to justify continuing the program. Supporters of these programs, the military one and the 2021 one, are some of the usual suspects. You have the ATA here, the Commercial Vehicle Training Association, Association and the National Retail Federation. Those who oppose it are also some of the similar suspects. You have OIDA and the National Transportation Safety Board. OIDA says this whole program, it was partly sold on a driver's shortage where OIDA contends there is not a driver shortage. Instead, there's a driver pay and a driver retention issue in this industry. Joe Biden has made some changes to this program to potentially make it easier for people to join. The two restrictions that he has dropped um, were requirements that truck 
that the trucks used in the program be equipped with inward-facing cameras and that motor carriers register their program with the Department of Labor. They dropped this. What do you all think? Should we have under 21 truckers going over the road? Do you like this apprenticeship program? Why do you think people aren't joining? Well, there's one great comment here from Gary Holstra, and I think it kind of sums up one of the reasons. He says there are several reasons no one is applying. The rules are too onerous and the paperwork is substantial. Removing these two requirements might help, especially the DOL registration, but I highly doubt it will have much of an impact. The real reason? Getting an insurer to insure under 21 interstate as part of the pilot is the big problem here. That's not happening. Hey, in the comments, let me know. What do you think? Very controversial subject. Some of you hate the idea. Some of you say it's fine. I can see arguments on both sides. Curious what you all think. Another story here, big theft I got to get you into. You can read the full thing on FreightWaves.com. This one has to do with embezzlement. So Brinley Heinemann reports a Minnesota man has pled guilty to federal court to embezzling more than $1.3 million from his employer, I-State Truck Carriers, in what was a multi-year scheme. The guy's name was Leo Arthur Keener. He's 55 of Hugo. He pleaded guilty last Wednesday in the U.S. District Court of Minnesota for mail fraud after he used his position from 2015 through 2022, a seven-year run of pocketing company money allegedly while working at the Inver Grove Heights location at the body shop and service manager what he would do was create false purchase tickets he created a shell company he submitted over $750,000 in fake vendor requests and he swiped a lot of this money what was he doing with it? Well, it says here he spent the stolen cash on luxury cars, a boat, and a gambling trip to Las Vegas. He hasn't been sentenced yet, so we'll see uh, what the dice comes up with the judges there. And one last PSA. Summertime is coming up. The vacationers are coming. Take a look at this trailer right here. King Spud CEO and says, this is why I won't tow a camper without a dually. Yeah, good thing nobody was next to him. He's getting flipped around. Nick Tomez, AZ, says, it's not that windy, babe. I got this. And for you audio listeners, we're seeing a, a truck pulling a, um, just a regular pickup truck, and it's pulling an RV camper right behind it, and the wind is killing it. Brandon Christian says, or Brandon Chastain says, yesterday, I seen so many different combinations of what the, f of what the F with people pulling campers. Just tried my best to get past them so that when the S hits the fan, I wasn't part of the destruction. Todd Finch said, that is obviously Wyoming. The only time the wind slows down is when it's turning around to blow the other way and jim soprano he said vacation is over vacation may be over but it's time to get to some awesome guests on episode 704 of what the truck drivers start your engines relay payment ceo ryan droge gets us off the starting line for their hall of fame 2024 that we'll see a pair of drivers win a nascar experience in atlanta we'll find out how this event works how it went last year why i'm even a judge on this thing and i gotta ask ryan what i gotta know about being a judge it's gonna be so fun 1970 group ceo stefan roseman is here he's help he talks about helping customize minimized the the challenges caused by insurance carriers, collateral requirements, important topic, especially with insurance costs skyrocketing. Amos CEO Mark Shivchek, he talks about what's right and wrong with TMSs. We'll also learn how they're partnering to help prevent fuel fraud. Another big issue that has been going on uh, and a bunch of other things. But Ryan Droge is here right now, CEO at Relay Payments. I am so excited. But before we even get to this event, I have to say happy fifth birthday to you and the team over there, Ryan. Thank you. We appreciate it. Yeah, five years running. It's been a good five years. Holding it down in the ATL for five years strong. Uh, what? Let's reminisce for a second. What's your greatest memory over these past five years from Relay? Oh, man. I think uh, all the people that joined the team. You know, we've hired over 150 teammates and just uh, we've had people move to Atlanta from kind of all over the U.S. to join the team. And that's pretty special. That's pretty fun. Well, hey, I am excited about this year because there is an event coming up. I covered it last year on the show. We did a few interviews about it. But this year, I actually get to be involved. I get to be a judge. Let's tell everyone what's going on, Ryan. Tell them about the event. Yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you for joining us as a judge, by the way. But uh, we are celebrating Relay's second year uh, of Hall of Fame. So it's a contest where anybody around the U.S. can nominate a professional driver that they feel really exemplifies the industry. Uh, it could be owner operators, could be company drivers, you know, we'll take nominations from anywhere. And uh, those nominations will be reviewed by a panel of judges, uh, which you are one of them. Uh, I am one of them. One of them is the famous NASCAR driver, Jeff Gordon. Uh, so that's pretty fun. And then we also have Clarissa Rankin, which is a professional driver who a lot of you may know from her TikTok videos. Um, and what the drivers will win is a all-inclusive 
uh, really weekend package uh, at the Quaker State 400 here in September. So we're fortunate enough at Relay to partner with uh, the Hendricks Motorsports team and William Byron, who drives the number 24 car. So you get a behind the scenes tour of all the Hendricks Motorsports garages. You get to meet William Byron. You get to see the car. Uh, and you just all showed a pretty good picture of what the color scheme will look like. Um, and you get a race weekend. And who doesn't love a weekend at NASCAR? If you've ever been, it's just all around good fun. So two drivers uh, and two guests will win an all-inclusive travel, hotel, walk around money, $250 in fuel. Uh, it's a pretty good price package. So we're, we're here today to announce that nominations are open. Uh, you can start submitting drivers right now at relaypayments.com slash hall of fame. Uh, they will stay open until June 30th, uh, and then myself and you, Dooner, and a few other folks will start judging, and we will announce the winner September 3rd before the race weekend. We have a message here from William Byron. Let's like let's see what he has to say about this upcoming race. Hey guys, I'm excited to partner with Relay Payments again this year. Really looking forward to it. Uh, and we're going to offer the fans a chance to design our paint scheme for Chicago and Atlanta. So follow the link in the caption to pick from the four finalists. Don't let me down. I'm looking for a good paint scheme. Oh, Ryan, have you cast your vote on the paint scheme yet? I did. Yeah, the uh, the black and white one uh, is a pretty solid, pretty solid paint scheme. So uh, maybe we'll take we'll use the green one next year. That was my second favorite. Well, this is the second year of this of this happening. I think we have some highlights from year one, if we can roll that. But tell us how the first year of this went. What, what we expect this year, too? Yeah, so the first year was, you know, just excellent all around. Um, the two winners were Jamie Hagan, who I think you actually know of uh, uh, a good friend of yours, and then Sergio and Juan Arona from Lake Trucking. So they were able to come out with us. They got to meet the uh, Hendricks Motorsports team. They got to meet Jeff Gordon. Uh, and we got to meet them. You know, we heard their stories through the nominations. We got to meet them in person and just hang out with them for a couple days. Um, but it was a very successful event. So we had nominations uh, from around the country. Um, and so we're opening it up again and uh, extending the time period. So we hope more people will join and submit professional drivers that you all feel really exemplify the industry. Here's some uh, here's some key days for your nominations. They opened April 9th, which was yesterday. Public voting for the 15 finalists. You have July 3rd through July 31st on the show. Of course, I'll keep you all aware of that on my social media as well. The five finalists are going to be announced on August 1st. There's the celebrity judging, which just takes place August 1st through August 6th. I guess that's when I have to do some work. And those winners are announced on September 3rd. Now, when this driver wins, like how does the NASCAR experience work? What is this driver going to be doing? Yeah, so you're going to come in uh, first. You get travel to the event, so this will be at the, the Atlanta Motor Speedway, uh, kind of in south of Atlanta. Um, you and your guests come in, and normally the event kind of starts Saturday night. So the races are all on Sunday, but Saturday night we'll have an event. Uh, you'll get to meet some of the relay team. You possibly will meet William at that point in time, and then the next day uh, is when we go to an all-day race event. So starting from the morning up until the race at night, you know we'll be on the track. You get a behind the scenes tour, you get to meet the drivers, you get to see the garage. Um, if you've never done it, it's it's pretty special. It's about as close as you can get uh, to the sport. What kind of advice do you have for me as a judge? Were you a judge last year? What kind of criteria are you looking for here? What, what do I what should I be thinking about? Yeah, so I mean, you know, we got about 100 nominations last year um, and they were all great, right? I think the hardest part is kind of how do you whittle it down and how do you really find somebody that exemplifies the industry? And so uh, we expect to get a lot more nominations this year. Um, and so as a judge, you know, I just enjoyed it because I got to hear all the stories, right? Yeah, even even of the folks who didn't quite make to the top two, um, it makes you really proud of the industry. Uh, you see all these professional drivers out there, how they carry themselves, how they act, you hear the stories, um, and it's just encouraging. And then it's kind of our job. We have the tough job, right? You know, we got to whittle it down to the to the final two um, but that was my favorite part last year was honestly reading all the submissions have you gotten a chance to drive one of the cars on that track last year i did i went down to the atlanta motor speedway i had a race a couple of other gentlemen 
in logistics, I was a little nervous. And they make you take a course beforehand. And they, you know, you go in, you put the jumpsuit on. They, they scare you a little bit. They're like, you know, don't drive into any walls or anything. You get kicked off the track. You might have to pay for this. So, you, you know, you pay attention. Safety is really important when you go on these. But I'm standing in line with the guys. And then uh, all of a sudden the announcer like, yeah, and if you're not comfortable doing the stick off the line, we can give you a push out. And I'm like, man, I haven't driven anything with a stick in like 20 years. But there is no way I'm getting a push out. I've played enough video games recently. I've played enough Gran Turismo. And you know what, Ryan? I won that race. I beat those other guys in logistics. Good for you. Yeah, you got. You just got to do it. No, I have not done the race, but that sounds that sounds pretty fun. Uh, you know, we're in Atlanta, so it sounds like uh, you just suggested a pretty good team outing. Yeah. Well, for people coming out to um, Atlanta, out to Relay, what's good to do out there? And is this like is this an event people can actually like come to and, and watch like William race at? Yeah, so, you know, I, um, I think you're a big NASCAR fan. You've been to a lot of the events, but people will drive from all over, right? They'll, uh, they'll bring their RVs. I saw that little short clip of where uh, somebody wasn't driving their RV too great, uh, but a lot of people will uh, drive their RVs. They'll bring their kids. They'll bring their family. Um, and so we have lots of folks come in, and Atlanta is obviously a big airport with Hartsfield, and so you can fly into the airport. It's about another half hour south hotels, camping, uh, make a weekend of it. But it's going to be a good race. It's going to be a good time. Our big event is coming up in Atlanta in a few weeks, so I'll be able to do it not a few weeks, in June. Well, that's a kind of, actually, it is kind of a few weeks now, right? We're at April 10th. Yeah, it's pretty soon. I was right? thinking, like, this is far off, but now we're already in April 10th, and this is less than two months away. So, yeah, like, seven weeks, we're going to be out in Atlanta, hanging with all you. you. can get tickets for that at live.freightwaves.com. Now, one more time, how do people uh, get involved with this now? You mentioned we can start nominating drivers. What website do I send them to? Yeah, so nominations are open. They started yesterday. Relaypayments.com slash Hall of Fame. And Hall is spelled H-A-U-L, right? Like you're hauling a load. Um, and nominations will stay open until June 30th. And so you mentioned, you know, that, that'll get here quicker than you think. So go ahead and get your nominations in. Uh, after those nominations close, we'll have a public vote where we'll share a lot of the stories to try to get down to the first cut of 15 uh, and then you myself clarissa and jeff gordon will kind of cut it down from there uh, and we'll get to the two finalists i can't wait i can't wait i'm so excited to get down to hot land to do this now i'm so excited i gotta spin the wheel of stupid questions for you ryan before i let you go let's do it right around it goes who knows where it's gonna land let's find out oh this is a good one okay what is a good gift to get somebody that you hate that's pretty funny um <laughs> Good gift to, you know, that's, what have I gotten somebody that I really don't like? A parrot? Parrots, they live like 100 years. Yeah, that's fair. An unwanted pet is a pretty good one, right? Yeah, because there's no, there's no undoing that. You just drop it off and... Uh, yeah, a parrot. We'll go with the parrot. You go with the parrot. Well, hey, thank you so much. I'll see you out in Atlanta soon enough, and we'll keep covering this thing as it comes along. I'm really looking forward to it. And everyone, go vote and nominate your favorite driver in that Hall of Fame. And also, shout out to Jamie Hagan for winning last year. I know. Uh, yeah, it was uh, good. It was good to meet him. His Hellbent Express sticker is right here on the front of my cowbell. There you go. Yeah. Well, thank you for judging as well. So look forward to seeing you at the race. All right, man. Well, take care. Have a great. Uh, what is today? Wednesday. Have a great Wednesday. You too. Take it easy. All right. Let's get pumped up, everybody. My my buddy, former truck driver, current trainer, Mike Lombard. Meanwhile. Here we go. Day 7, 75 hard. We're talking about persistence. A great story about persistence lies in June 14th, 1800 at the Battle of Marengo. Napoleon was taking on those pieces. of Habsburgs. But throughout the entire battle, Napoleon encouraged his men that we sleep on the battlefield. The fighting got so fucked tense the french were pissing on their muskets to cool them down but they didn't quit setback after setback they persisted and the most important part is while they persisted and suffered the enemy thought that they had already won the french fought this battle after they already climbed the alps they had worked so hard why didn't they just quit they refused to accept anything but sleeping on the mother battlefield the austrians drunk with victory became confused so confused they couldn't even Notice General to say, and Francois Kellerman's cavalry about to absolutely kick him in the dick. That persistence led to total victory. Right now, you could be that guy pissing on your musket because it sucks so bad. But the longer you persist, the closer you are to becoming the cavalry. 
Okay, Mike. Jeez. I love Mike Lombard. If you're if you ever had an orange theory, he's a trainer over there, former truck driver, and he can cut a mean promo while running down the street. But let's meet a new guest, Stefan Roseman. He's the founder, chairman, and CEO over at 1970 Group. And I gotta say, I love that backdrop behind you. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thanks so much. By the way, I like Mike's energy. I don't know that I'm going to be able to match that energy for the podcast. I don't know if anybody can. Like, I, I, you know, I put that. To, I, I can seem at the uh, at the level. But hey, it's really great to meet you. For those who have not met you before, what's sort of the elevator pitch on yourself before we jump to the company? Yeah, so I am a uh, career investor in uh, in financial services and specifically helping uh, businesses solve problems. And uh, that's actually ultimately what gave rise to 1970 Group and active in transportation and logistics and uh, looking forward to being here with you. Now, I got to ask you, so 1970 Group, if we haven't heard of it, I have two questions. First of all, why the name? And second of all, what do you all get into? <sighs> Uh, so the name question comes up in just about every meeting. So uh, good pickup on that. So it is the uh, the founder's vintage, uh, which is to say my birth year. Oh, okay. Well, that that, that makes a lot of sense. And uh, you know, you get into stuff like collateral and insurance. Tell me a little bit about that. Whoa, what's that all about? Yeah. So a lot of your constituents, and frankly, much of corporate America, has a need to post collateral to satisfy the requirements of their insurance carriers. And as a practical matter, what that means is, is the company is taking some portion of their balance sheet and setting it aside for their insurance carrier. And this has been something that companies have done and been required to do for decades. And while it's common practice, it doesn't change the fact that it is an encumbrance on the insured's balance sheet. So in, in your case, for example, constituents in and around transportation and logistics are taking some of their valuable cash, some of their valuable liquidity, and setting it aside to satisfy the carrier. That's the problem we solve. Because as you can imagine, nobody wants to have less access to liquidity, less access to cash. So we come in and are able to provide a solution to help that company, that freight company, that transportation logistics company, solve the problem by renting our balance sheet so they don't have to use theirs. That's the, uh, the proverbial elevator pitch. Well, that, that makes sense. You know, we're in a climate right now where insurance costs, especially in trucking, are getting really, really, really high. Uh, they're putting some carriers out of business. Some companies can't even afford their renewals. How can something like collateral, because you mentioned it keeps cash on the book and everything. I bet there's some carriers that are struggling and they're like, look, we just need some more free cash. For those of you who don't know, this is a business with very small margins. So there can be times you can find yourself very, very cash tight. How has this tool helped me here in this insurance environment? So, Tim, you nailed it. The problem is for, uh, for the, the freight logistics companies, they have to post collateral. They have to post some of their balance sheet. Now, that balance sheet, to your point about low margins and perhaps a, uh, an economic environment that is not as conducive as it may have been months or years ago, requires them to find alternatives for running their business from a cash perspective. Because if you're generating less cash from operations, you're looking to your balance sheet, right? To your proverbial piggy bank, your access to capital within your own business to fund that gap. So if your insurance carrier is asking you to post collateral, you're tying up some portion of your balance sheet to satisfy their requirement, but you could otherwise be using that to operate your business, to run your business. So that's where we play a pivotal role and an essential role in helping those companies, those freight trucking logistics companies, recapture that or repatriate that, that critical balance sheet to help bridge that gap and to run their business. Very interesting. Now, like, do you have any examples of, of someone you've done this for or how this works in like the real world? We do this day in and day out for corporate America. So we are the market adopted solution for corporate America to solve this problem. And so we do indeed, um, we have had companies, for example, come to us and I'll specifically hone in on, uh, on your specialty, right? And the purpose of this, uh, uh, this broadcast, this podcast is uh, we have a company that is a active uh, acquirer of other businesses. And of course, an acquisition strategy requires capital. And they were out buying smaller tuck-in acquisitions, regional ca carriers, freight carriers, and 
they were looking for the proverbial uh, nickels, dimes, quarters under the sofa cushions to fund those incremental acquisitions. Uh, they've been a client of ours for years at this point. We were able to step into the breach for them at a time when not only did they need incremental funding to fund these acquisitions, but they were also suffering from adverse claims development, which is the, uh, the insurance industry way of saying the company's claims had really become a problem for not only the company, but also for their insurance carrier. And as a consequence, and you touched on this a few minutes ago, premiums have gone up. Premiums have gone up dramatically, especially in certain segments of insurance, certain lines, uh, as the industry calls them. And as you are well aware, the commercial auto is a, a key part of that. And the, the solution to, uh, to those increased rates are, is finding incremental liquidity from your existing balance sheet to fund not only the increased premiums, but in this company's case, in this client's case, the increased premiums and the acquisitions they were making. So we were able to come in, offer them a solution that allowed them to repatriate their critical capital, so which is to take their, their critical capital back onto their balance sheet, allowing them to make those acquisitions, continue to run their business. And it was at a time when we first met them Interestingly enough, and this is going to be something that all of your listeners are very familiar with, it was at a time when they were suffering from acute driver shortages. And a big part of their acquisition strategy really required them repopulating their, uh, their, their, their driver population. And they were uh, struggling with that. And that incremental liquidity ultimately played a key role in them thriving. And fast forward to today, and the business is in much better shape. Uh, they have gotten their, uh, their risk program which is to say their, their work comp commercial auto program where they needed it and have continued to fund their growth. And that comes right out of your, uh, right out of your listener group, as it were. What size fleet typically benefits from something like this? Yeah, so um, typically our clients are uh, what we call larger middle market or what the industry calls larger middle market. So on the very small end, and I'm going to answer it a little differently than the way you asked it. I'll talk about revenue as opposed to fleet size. Sure. Uh, because, of course, the mix of the business matters a lot. But you're talking about companies that are doing typically at least $100 million of revenue or more. Um, there's nothing uh, There's nothing special about that number, $100 million, meaning it could be a company doing $90 million. Uh, but you're really talking about that neighborhood of revenue before we're able to step in and help. Because a critical component of what a company has to have is they have to have audited financials or reviewed financials. Your, your smaller fleets just aren't going to have companies that have auditor reviewed financials, and that would create a stumbling block for us. So that's why you tend to see larger businesses are typically our clients. Very, very interesting. Now, what should transportation companies, your, your type of clients, the people you'd like to attract, what, what should they be aware of that maybe coming up this year or they're not thinking about that you'd really like to put in their head? Well, look, we still have the, uh, w with respect to the industry, we still have some of the micro considerations around access to drivers, commercial insurance rates going up. How do you solve that? What's the right footprint for your business? You know, a lot of folks have been growth minded by acquisition per the conversation we were having just a couple minutes ago. And while um, while that has been a common strategy for a lot of industries, by the way, not just transportation and logistics, the, the question that I think a lot of folks should, should be asking themselves is where are their most profitable business lines? Which states should we operate in? Which uh, what uh, what lines do we want to operate in from a um, from a hauling standpoint? Because being able to weather the storm of economic uncertainty, the macro uncertainty, uh, certainly rising rates, rising premiums. Obviously, there's the recent headlines out of the East Coast as it relates to the uh, to the, the the port shutting down because of the uh, the ship grounding and, and the bridge issue. You want to be able to make sure that you're driving maximum profitability as it relates to your current footprint before just making acquisition for the sake of acquisition. And we are well aware of the fact that a lot of companies like to grow through acquisition, not just organic growth. And there's nothing wrong with that strategy. But from my standpoint, I think it's best practices to make sure your own current house is in order before you think about getting other folks' house in order and bringing them into your business. That's my two cents on the topic anyways. I mean, hey, we've been in a freight market that's been about two years of 
decline. I, on Monday, I talked about it. Rates were down another 8% this week. So I know every single trucking company out there, or at least a lot of them, are looking for ways to get more cash on the book, especially until, especially as we wait for more freight volume to come in and recover. But it's been a long, sustained winter for a lot of these companies. Now, if someone needs your help, they need your services, where do I send them to? Uh, 1970group.com is our website. On our landing page, uh, you will find a 90 second or so explainer video about what we do. There is also an info at link uh, where you can shoot us an email for info at 1970group.com and somebody will get back to you as it relates to uh, being able to help you with the, uh, the collateral solution that would be tailored for your business. And of course, always happy to uh, be a resource for you, Tim, anytime you want uh, a perspective on collateral in the state of the the financing market and trucking, happy to join. Okay, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for stopping by the show today. Take care. Have a great Wednesday. Thanks so much. You too. Take it easy. All right, everybody, let's see what's going on elsewhere. Would you take this ferry? As long as you come along the route, that's the only way to cross. Now, I was we're looking at it's a semi-truck here pulling onto a ferry, and the ferry is made out of, how many canoes is that? One, two, three, like four or five canoes with a big board across it, and this guy's got to take, he's got to take that across there. So I asked the community, dispatch sends you a load along this route, you arrive at the ferry, what's your next move? Michael Fitzgerald says, submit my resignation. Stephen Parrish says, plot twist, the ferry operators are also the brokers. Gabrielle Garcia says, sketchy AF. Mark and Dina said, we would call our insurance company before boarding the ferry. Probably a smart move. Michael Vincent has some smart ideas. Shout out, Michael. He says, uh, shout out to the dude. He says, save this video because the consignee will deny the accessorial ferry charge. Yeah, smart advice. Matt McCullen says, uh, which one is the OSHA guy? And Craig Lewis says, we might be restricting ourselves from innovation because of too much OSHA. Interesting. Mark's here. Mark Svizek, co-founder and CEO over at Amos. Mark, how you doing? Would you, whoa, dispatch sends you to that ferry. What are you doing? Oh, man, I run away as fast as I can. <laughs> There's no way I'm going to have any involvement in that. What is the, like, what's the scariest mo mode of transportation? You Like, what's the scariest ride you've ever taken in, like, a plane, a boat, a car, a truck? Oh, uh, that would have to be, so um, I'm originally, you know, well, I'm from Chicago, but my family is uh, from Ukraine. So uh, back in the you know 90s, a lot of the Ukrainian airlines got the Russian airplanes, Ooh. the Antonovs. Uh, so like the propellers from like the 60s and 70s. So that was probably the most scariest ride I've ever taken in my life. Oh, man, I, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Mine was in uh, during my honeymoon in Costa Rica the, to get to like Porto de Leymon. It was this really, really long ride. And we had a driver. And whenever you get across these little bridges they have in Costa Rica, they're one lane bridges. And you're coming around like it's two lane road, though. There's traffic going both ways. But oh, the yeah. bridge itself is one lane. And I'm asking my driver. His name was Bruli. I'm like, Pira Vida, Burley. I'm like, well, how do you know there's not another car going to come and hit us head on? And he's like, oh, you know, I think we have the right of way. It was it was a little nerve wracking. <laughs> How do you like Costa Rica? I actually, uh, I got married there and I lived there for half a year. So oh, I, I love that country, everything about it. Dude, I thought it was beautiful. So, you know, like everyone, you fly into San Jose. And then um, our first stop was a little touristy. We went to Arnal, where like the volcano is and everything. And we stayed yeah. there in the hot springs. And then from there, though, we really got to feel Costa Rica. We stayed at the Pacora Lodge, which is, it was like an eight hour drive from Arnal. Not that you can go fast on the roads in Costa Rica, but it took forever. And you have to white water raft into it. You have to white water raft into Ooh. this resort. And there's no power there except in like the main campus area where you eat and you're just like out in the jungle and you got a splash it was so beautiful and then we went to Puerto de Lemon on the uh on the Caribbean side and like that water you just float on it it's so salty and buoyant yeah yeah no it's a lot of fun did you try uh the zip lining by any chance I, I did and it was one of those things where um like as you're I wasn't thinking about it too much until I got all the way up there and then um there's a girl in front of me who's like maybe like 14 years old and she goes and I'm like well I, I can't back out now and we went and it was it was fine it was fine although there was two people who flew like directly into trees because like they didn't stop in time some of those you can get some momentum on those oh absolutely and uh, the biggest thing I remember is the bullet ants when you yes. were on the tree on the top on the platform and you see the like the big bullet ant uh, climbing and the instructor telling you that it's the most painful bike you can have that was for me that was like the most nerve-wracking part of it yeah, I, I don't know if that's part of the, like, is that part of the tour? Because one guy pointed to a little frog, and he was, like, my my uh, my guide, and he's, like, one touch of that frog can kill, like, a village of a thousand people. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay. There's some good marketing, right, <laughs> for let's, the zip lining. <laughs> let's keep going. Let's keep going. Well, hey, first of all, for people who've never met you before, they didn't get to meet you at Matt's like I did. What's a little elevator pitch on you and the company? 
Yeah, absolutely. So we're almost TMS. We're a transportation management system that is a fully cloud-based enterprise system built for uh, carriers, brokers, 3PLs, and shippers. So that way you can uh, manage all your operations in one place, but also multiple companies within one account. And uh, one of the biggest things that we push from our side is that we try to build what we call an ecosystem. So we integrate with pretty much anything out there, any kind of system, uh, because we understand the value of data within the TMS. So that way you can execute on what kind of decisions you need to make about your company. So whether it's receiving data into the TMS, sending it out, we have the correct architecture, the correct technology to make it uh, you know, a very comprehensive visibility for companies to be able to make the right decisions about their operations. Now, Mark, some say it takes a brave man to make a TMS, so near the co-founder <laughs> here. I gotta ask you, yeah. what, what was the idea behind the company? Do you remember when you're like, you know what, I gotta spring out my own, I gotta start this thing. What, what, tell me, take us back. Yeah, absolutely. So like I said, my uh, family is originally from Ukraine. Uh, so when a lot of people come to the United States from Ukraine, there's usually two jobs they can do. They can do uh, trucking or uh, construction, right? Just because they, you know, the language, the education, all that stuff, it uh, becomes a little bit difficult. But I grew up within trucking, right? I was the guy in uh, the Christmas party where I was watching my uncles pulling out the phone and comparing who has the better Volvo, right? Uh, so I saw everything and the older I got, you know, I started getting into the operations more. I started going into the offices, seeing how they work and uh, really seeing how, you know, everything was really broken when it comes to technology. I mean, even at this point, I would say it's about, you know, 15, 20 years behind a lot of new TMSs, new tech coming out, which is awesome. And I, you know, really support that, but there's still a long road ahead of us. And uh, when I was at the University of Miami, I really wanted to get into the technology sphere, uh, wanted to build out a system, enterprise system of sorts. Uh, started with a hotel uh, application called Pillow, but obviously that didn't work out. And the stars aligned, we brought the correct people together. Uh, you know, people who had a lot of experience within logistics, you know, building technology within logistics. Uh, and we wanted to build a system that was the best TMS on the market. And that's exactly what we did. Shame the pillows didn't work out. I think we need more pillows as a service. Maybe you were just ahead, right. of, your, ahead of your time. So what would that be? P, lowercase a, a, s, a little, a little pass going on there. Well, yeah, right. I mean, it was during, you know, like the 2014. So it was P-I-L-L-O without the W because... We were edgy, right? Oh, you were edgy. You were, well, I mean, look at you now. I saw you at Matt's. You're hanging out with companies like Bosch, and I was looking at your mm -hmm. website. You've got all these integrations. How have you, how have you built the company? Why are people working with, with you? There's a lot of TMS yeah. choices. Why you guys? Um, the biggest part is, you know, obviously I mentioned that we have the right technology in place, the architectures to be able to handle any type of uh, solution that we want to build, quite honestly. But uh, ultimately, it's the people, right? Uh, when it comes to a technology company, uh, developers are a very big part of it. Right. And uh, finding a good developer is a hard thing, but finding a good developer within logistics is even harder. Right. Uh, so that's something that we really invest in within Amos is even, you know, taking people from, uh, you know, university interns, whatever it is, and training them in the best practices, you know, the Amos way. And eventually they become super, super developers within the logistics sphere. And that really gave us the opportunity to go out and work with a lot of big companies because, uh, a big part of a TMS or any type of software is uh, there's no really out-of-box solution that can fit every single type of operation, right? So you have to be very flexible. You have to have the ability to go in and quickly develop new features, integrate new companies, new softwares, whatever it may be. And because we made the correct decision to invest in our people, you know, eight years ago when we started almost, uh, you know, at this point, we're reaping the benefits. Wow. Is that, where, does the name mean anything? We're like, what is Amos? Uh, yeah, almost actually came in a dream, so it means a noble friend. Oh, interesting. Uh, yeah, you were just you're just asleep, and so almost, almost, and you're like, this well, is yeah, right, <laughs> almost, almost. Uh, the thing is, I always say that starting a company is hard, but finding the name for a company is even harder. Yeah, uh, for some reason, it's just, it's just so tough. But uh, you know, sitting there thinking about how am I going to name the company, how am I going to name the company, uh, it just kind of becomes, you know, like you're meditating about it, and eventually, in the dream, it comes to you, and you're like, okay, that's the name of the company, that's the fate. What, what? So, first of all, I saw you at Matt's. How did you like the event? What kind of feedback were you getting there? I mean, that that event. If you like trucking at all, if you like trucks, even if you're not in this industry, you just like trucks. It's not like a lot of logistics conferences where you spend like over a thousand dollars to go. I think it's either like free. Maybe it was free because I'm a media, but even if you have to pay, it was like twenty five <laughs> bucks at the most. But you, yeah. like, there's like sixty thousand people there. It was it was crazy. It was like Candyland. What did you think? 
Yeah, well, Mass was the first time that I ever uh, went to that trade show or this year that we went to that trade show. And by the way, it was great meeting you finally in person. But um, it's amazing. I mean, you know, they said it was about 70,000 people across, uh, you know, the three days that the uh, trade show was going on. Uh, for me, it was great because I was able to walk around and, you know, see all the different partners that we have, the integrations, talk with people, you know, anything from a single owner operator up to a shipper that has 300 trucks, 1,000 trucks, right? It's just such a wide uh, range of uh, audience. Uh, in, in, in that show and a lot of down-to-earth people that you can just have a simple conversation really just talk about hey you know what's going on in your company what's happening in Amos uh, how can we help you right and not even do a sales pitch let's say just have a conversation but uh, for me the biggest quite honestly awesome part of the uh, the show was walking around and seeing the crazy crazy trucks outside yeah. uh, I don't know if you had a chance to go out there but uh, I do remember one that had a shotgun as uh, the stick shifter right uh inside the truck and they were blaring music and it was just uh overall the atmosphere you know people barbecuing outside walking around just having a good time you know i know there was a country um uh, concert yeah at the end of it didn't have a chance to join it but overall if you have never been to matt's i would 100 percent uh you know uh, recommend going there yeah it's a good time over in louisville yeah. as i learned when i was out there now i saw something interesting on your site this is a topic that's been coming up it's fuel fraud and you've partnered to help stop this how are you helping prevent fuel fraud and what's the issue right now yeah absolutely um so this is something that really came up uh as a hot topic last year i would say where a lot of trucking companies our, our clients were even contacting and saying hey someone skimmed my fuel card uh and uh you know i have five thousand charges here ten thousand charges here what do i do with that right uh the the fuel provider has to do an investigation you're out five ten grand in this market that's a big blow right yeah. So what we did at first on the Amos side is we started looking at all our fuel card integrations, uh, specifically with, let's say, EFS pilot, whatever it is, and create some sort of fallback where we can eliminate that. Uh, so that means the driver through the mobile app going in and turning on and off the fuel card, the dispatcher doing it through the system. But eventually, uh, through one of our good uh, clients, you know, at, at this point, they're our partner, uh, we were able to get connected with uh, Relay Payments even and found out that they were building a digital fuel card. And that was exciting because this was a huge step into, you know, how the uh, fuel theft and fuel fraud can go down. So, uh, you know, proud to say that we were the first TMS to integrate with them. Uh, you know, we work together on it. Uh, they have a very good team. And, you know, throughout that process, uh, we were able to build even a live data stream of fuel directly into the TMS. So that way, trucking companies can go in and see exactly, you know, how much fuel am I spending every single day, deduct it from the drivers on the owner operators, you know, do some sort of analytics and reporting. Is this truck utilizing too much fuel versus other ones? And what do I do with this truck, right? Kind of execute on that data because you have the clean data within the TMS and real time data. So uh, fuel fraud was a very, very hot topic, still is a very hot topic. And uh, we're really proud of, you know, our partners and the team internally in Amos TMS with what we were able to do it to, to basically eliminate it. Yeah, there was a, re a report last year that 50% of the fleets in this report, they estimated that 5% uh, or more of their total fuel spend is fraudulent. Why, why is this yeah. such an easy attack vector or why has this traditionally been one? Uh, why is it so easy to go in and skim a fuel card? Yeah, why? Basically, yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's simple. I mean, uh, you can go on eBay or any, um, probably not eBay, but some sort of uh, website and buy a skimmer and place it on top of uh, you know the 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 checkout uh, little. Oh, I forgot what it's called. They're doing like sorry. the same as a credit card uh, but, skimmer, uh, right? You blew it. Same thing as like a credit card skimmer. Go tug it, on it that. You're exactly at that pump. Pull on you that thing. Can't even tell. Yeah, even the owners of the company or, you know, the owner of the of the gas station won't be able to tell that there's a skimmer. So once they put it on there, the moment you put your card in, take it out, they have all your information within five minutes. Uh, even though you may be in Dallas, Texas, Chicago, Illinois, you have a charge, right? Los Angeles, California, you have a charge and that's it. And they have to move fast, right? Uh, because once you get with uh, as the trucking company that someone stole your credit card or, you know, the fuel card, you're going to stop it. So they have to move fast to get as much uh, money out of it. And that's why, you know, I think that the 5% is really happening. You know, you have something really interesting on your on your website it was this Amos Athletes program. And it got me curious. What is this all about? 
Yeah, uh, this is something that uh, has really been a part of uh, almost since the beginning. So something that we noticed when we were hiring a lot of our uh, initial employees, uh, core employees within the TMS is uh, when you hire an employee, they they have this other kind of push on them, right? Uh, they have a lot of conviction, a lot of uh, responsibility to make sure the job is done. Uh, so we were really excited to bring in uh, a lot of athletes who wanted to learn how to code, wanted to learn how to, uh, you know, logistics works. And we invested in them um, and that you know investment really paid off for us and for them and so we wanted to build on top of that entire uh, you know program that we have with our employees to go out and start sponsor uh, you know athletes especially college athletes we know that uh, you know recently the NCAA double uh, NCAA allowed athletes to receive sponsorships from companies uh, so we wanted to give them an opportunity to get their name out especially you know with like let's say the NFL draft coming out they can get their name out even more uh, so it was just a win-win for everybody and you know a lot of people on our side love sports and uh, you know lo we love to be a part of it and it's just a great opportunity uh, to really help out people that uh, you know again want to get their name out yeah win 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 you you get to bring an athlete it's good marketing it's good publicity it's yeah. a good program to help these athletes learn and understand our crazy world of logistics well we have about two minutes left so this is kind of a lightning question for you here sure. what is the biggest mistake that carriers and or brokers are making right now with their TMS? Um, I'll be quite honest. I think it's uh, looking for candy. And what I mean by that is when they're looking at a TMS, they're simply looking, does it look nice, right? As far as I'm talking about the user interface. Uh, the user interface might be the best thing that you ever see, but I would really recommend carriers and brokers uh, start asking more deeper questions as far as what are the functionalities of a TMS? How can you solve specific problems? If you're doing a demo with the TMS, provide them specific examples. These are the types of lanes and runs that I do. Uh, can you recreate them within the TMS, right? Uh, because a lot of times people will jump around, you know, do five, 10 demos, everything will get meshed up in their head as far as uh, what TMS does what. Um, and then they just end up selecting the one that I believe is, you know, the nicest UI, for instance, right? I'm not saying that's the, always the case, but uh, that's something that we've been seeing often uh, from the AMO side. So I would just say, do your research a little bit more, uh, you know, t uh, talk about the technology, right? If you're doing a demo with a, with a TMS, they should be very happy to talk about the type of tech stack they're using, you know, what they're doing different versus other TMSs and uh, really question everything, right? Uh, I even recommend that for people that come to AMO's question as much, as much as you can. If I'm doing a demo, because I'm very highly involved within uh, that process is if I hear silence, you know, that's a problem. But if you're asking a lot of questions, that's a very good thing because you actually know what you're looking for. Very cool. Well, hey, check them out, Omar, and check out my buddy here, Mark. Go check out their website. Thank you so much for your time today. I appreciate you coming on What The Truck. Thank you so much. Appreciate hey, it. Take it easy. Right. Hey, thank you, everybody, for joining us on this episode of What The Truck. We'll be back Friday with Chase Barber. He's up in Edison Motors. He's got some issues up in Canada with the government over there not supporting Topsy, his electric truck. We're going to find out this whole issue that's been going on. We also have Road Dog Coffee Company stop by. Road Dog Trucking, Road Dog Coffee Company. Perfect time to take a taste test. Thank you so much for joining me. You can find the show on SiriusXM's Road Dog Trucking Channel 146, wherever you get podcasts by looking up What the Truck. Great Ways YouTube channel, the live stream at noon. And you can find me on Twitter at Duna. That's D-O-O-N-E-R. Take care and don't be a stranger.